Let us turn together in God's word to Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's an enormously rich passage, and we can probably take in only verses 35 through 58. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 35. You see, and Paul comes in immediately with a question about how will we, one day when we die, how will we come back to life? In what shape? So he says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earth is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne or carried the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, a mystery in, in the Bible does not necessarily mean a secret that somebody else can never know. It just means it's a mind-bending reality. We will not all sleep. So we will not all die. But we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, 
and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Thus far the reading from God's unadulterated and true word. Will you please also turn with me to Lord's Day 22 in this Creeds and Confessions booklet, this thin one. And that's Lord's Day 22, and that is on page, yeah, that's on page 30, page 30. And my brother and sister, you may notice that there are two questions, 57 and, and 58, and both use in them the word comfort. Because let's face it, here on this earth, you and I often crave for comfort. 57, how does the resurrection of the body comfort you? Answer, not only my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but even my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. How does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Answer, even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. And thus far our reading from the Heidelberg Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in both questions of Lord's Day 22, the word comfort is used. The first question says, how does the resurrection of the body, and the second one says, how does life everlasting comfort you? And let's face it, it is true. When you and I are dealing with death, the death of a loved one, or even with the reality of our own death, we do need to be comforted. You see, some 40 years ago when my mother died, she was 56 when she died, six years younger than I am now. One very godly neighbor, an elderly man, said to me, Peter, death is something that should never have existed. And of course, my brother and sister, you and I know that. And one commentator has described this pain very well. Says he, At death, body and soul are wrenched apart. Well, in my lifetime up until now, at least 15 of my closest relatives have passed away. Grandfathers and grandmothers, my mother and father, some uncles and aunts, and my brother when he was 55 years old. 
And looking back, it was the comfort, it was the hope, it was the assurance given us by God through the fact that he rose our Lord Jesus from the dead. It strengthened us every time. You see the answers to question 57 and 58, Lord's Day 22, do not only explain what happens to my soul and body after death, but it also makes the bold statement that that dreaded situation at my deathbed, when my body and soul will be torn apart, that will one day be reversed. Body and soul will be united again. For this, we have the example and the power of our resurrected Lord. So, here is the main message of this sermon. This sermon has two parts, but here's the main message. What comfort, believer, body and soul will live forever. And so, the first point is soul after death. And the second point, body after death. So firstly then, soul after death. Some Christian groups that you may well know about, among other, our Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters believe that when the believer dies, his soul sleeps until the coming of our Lord Jesus. In other words, the soul is aware of nothing around it. Well, if these brothers and sisters were right, then the souls of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, would still be sleeping after all these nearly 4,000 years. And then the souls of the apostles, including that of the apostle Paul, who so desired to depart and be with Christ, would after 2,000 years still not be alert and not be with the Lord. And so, congregation, these brothers and sisters have built most of their argument or their doctrine of soul sleeping upon a literal interpretation of the Hebrew way of talking about death. You see, the ancient Hebrews had a euphemistic way of describing that someone has died. They used to say, so-and-so has fallen asleep. In many cultures, people use euphemisms or nicer ways of describing hard things, bad things, not so nice things. When someone is drunk, it could be said that he looked too deep into the bottle or that he lifted his elbow too high. A euphemistic way, a nicer way of saying he's drunk. Well, the Hebrew idiom, idiom he, she has fallen asleep, simply means he or she died. And it has nothing to do with soul sleeping. In fact, several Bible passages speak against the idea of soul sleeping. Our Lord Jesus confirmed the living of the soul after death when he spoke to the Sadducees and the, and the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees especially the Sadducees who had difficulties with this concept. They didn't believe in life after death. And this is what our Lord said. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham. In other words, Jesus does not say, I was the God of Abraham. 
He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then our Lord Jesus continues. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, our Lord was saying to these Sadducees, at this moment, Sadducees, as I'm speaking to you, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who died long ago, are alive and alert with the Father in heaven. For, says Christ, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Another passage supporting the idea of an alert soul immediately after death is, of course, our Lord's words to the forgiven criminal on the cross next to him. Words that we heard about two days ago on Good Friday. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Of course, I realize that the original Greek manuscripts did not use commas and full stops and exclamation marks and question marks, etc. So where should the comma come in the sentence of our Lord? Did Christ put the comma after the word today or before the word today? Did he say to the criminal next to him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, did he say, I tell you the truth today, you will eventually be with me in paradise. What did our Lord mean? I tell you the truth today and no later than today, today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, did he say, I tell you the truth, comma, today you will be with me in paradise? Well, it was certainly the latter. You see, when you look at all the other, I tell you the truth statements of Jesus Christ, he never ever added a time indicator when he said, I tell you the truth. Some translations have said it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, Jesus never added a time indicator there. So he never said, for example, to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say unto you today, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, Jesus did not add the word today. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, no one can see the kingdom of God, etc. Neither did our Lord say to Nathanael on that day when the Lord called Nathanael, I tell you the truth, today you shall see heaven open. No. Our Lord did not add the word today when he said, I tell you the truth. Nor did Christ say in the Sermon on the Mount, I tell you the truth today, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will disappear. No, he did not add the word, a time indicator, today. So why should he put a time indicator meaning Truly, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise one day. No. My brother and sister, in none of our Lord's I tell you the truth sayings did he use the word today or any other time indication for that matter. So there on the cross, comforting the forgiven criminal next to him, there was no reason for Christ to add the word today, followed by a comma, if he just wanted to say, I tell you the truth today, after your soul sleeping, one day, 
You will be with me in heaven. No. It makes only sense that Christ meant, I tell you the truth, comma, today, no later, you will be with me in paradise. So here is the comforting word and news from God's word. All indications are that after death, the believer's soul goes immediately and without delay to God in heaven. Thus, the catechism is totally biblical when it says, my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head. I love the way an old Dutch commentator has said it. It says, the minute we close the eyes of our loved ones, their last cry goes over into their first psalm. And of course, at the time when this old Dutch commentator lived, many people died in their homes. Lots of children died too. And they knew about closing the eyes of their loved ones. But there was the comfort. The minute we close the eyes of our loved ones, their last cry goes over into their first psalm. Look, did this not happen with Stephen, the first Christian martyr, who died on his knees while already seeing his Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He died while seeing Christ. So, until the Lord returns, our souls, without our bodies, yes, our disembodied souls will be with him. In a way, one could compare this mode of existence with the mode in which the angels are living. They are souls, they are spirits, without anything touchable. Angels have no bodies. My brother and sister, see why God's loved ones can have Peace in their deepest sorrow at the grave. The world stares into that grave, but the believer looks upward. He seeks the living away from the dead. Our loved ones who died in Christ are immediately with the Lord Jesus. And that is, as the Apostle Paul says, by far the best. Which brings us to the second and last half of the sermon. My body after death. We have just seen that the believer who dies has his soul immediately in heaven. Just as Christ's soul was immediately with his father. When Christ died on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. Instantly. Now. The Bible promises an even fuller afterlife. One in which not only the soul lives forever, but eventually also the body. You see, various non-Christian religions through the ages have rubbished the human body and they regarded only the soul to be eternal. And they have seen the soul as being kept captive in this life by this sinful body, a bit like a bird which is held captive in a cage. And so, these other religions have said, it's only when someone dies that the cage, the body, releases this precious soul. But the Bible has astonishing news. It says, no, 
the body too will live eternally. For that to happen, the dead body, yes, even the destroyed body, the cremated body, the decayed body, will have to be brought back to life, will have to be resurrected. Yet not, again, perishable, but imperishable, as the Apostle Paul said in our 1 Corinthians 15 passage. It will be glorified, like Christ's body is glorified. And here I have often thought, some of you will remember, that about three or four decades ago, a young man of the Reformed Church, Foxton, disappeared in the sea. And it's, they, it's never been found. And it's believed that a shark took him. Now you might say, how will the Lord get his body back on the last day? But for the Lord, that's nothing. He who created the body in the first place, is it too hard for him to collect the body, restore it to the exact same looks? My brother and sister, is it not so? Does the Bible not tell us that the believer's body and the body of his Lord are tied up, the one with the other, you ask, in what way? Well, in this way. If someone denies that Jesus' body rose from the dead, like may, my agnostic friend said, then that person will also deny that the bodies of believers will be raised from the dead. Again, as my agnostic friend said. Similarly, if somebody denies that our bodies will be raised from the dead, then he will also deny that Christ rose from the dead. My brother and sister, on this, our New Testament passage is very clear. The believer's body will be raised and glorified just like Christ's. This means that your and my soul, which was wrenched from the body when we died, remember, Christ's soul was wrenched from his human body when he died, will, when the Lord returns, will our soul be reunited with our body, just like Christ's human soul was reunited again with his resurrected body. Then, and then we will be new. We will be glorified just like our Lord. And that again reminds me of another a former member of the Foxton Church. He died three weeks after his one leg was amputated. And so his, his leg was taken away by the hospital. And the hospital did with it whatever they do with human parts that they destroy. Three weeks later, this man died. When the Lord comes, will he be having one and a half leg? No. He will have two legs, and it will be glorified. Now this bodily resurrection on the pattern of that of our Lord Jesus, my brother and sister, it means several things. That you and I will be recognizable, just as our risen Lord was recognizable by those who had known him. We will be able to defy the laws of nature, go through closed doors like our Lord did, and go up or down without gravity interfering. 
We will be able to eat like our risen Lord demonstrated to the disciples, yet we will not be dependent on food all the time. We will never have any pain, aging, sickness, hospitals. Our new bodies, like his body, as Romans 6 says, will never die again. It's mind-bending. The suffering Christian, the one on life support in hospital, or the frail elderly cloistered to a chair or a bed in a care home, may well pray. O oh Lord, I know everything happens in your time, but Lord, I wish I was with you already. And if they prayed that, they will not be the first believer to pray that. Remember Job. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. But hang on. To everyone who longs to be in the state of the resurrected body, we must say, you only get to that state in one of two ways. Either at Christ's return, when your body will be changed in an instant, as our New Testament passage said, or you have to die. After all, our New Testament passage does say, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You see, dying, says the Apostle Paul, is like a seed falling into the ground. And there, when it's hidden from the human eye, it is submitted to great changes. And finally it comes up as a plant, new and glorious. Two things from this picture are obvious. What comes out is quite different to what went in. Secondly, before the seed can become a plant, it must die. It must cease to be a seed. My brother and sister, if our Lord Jesus does not return in your and my lifetime, we will also die. Now normally, before a person dies, he gets older. He ages. All of us do. And I love how the Christian author describes it. Aging is one of the ways by which God keeps us headed homeward. Even I, when I look in the mirror every day, and I see the wrinkles on my forehead, they look more like my omas. I see I'm getting older. I'm headed in one direction. And so aging is one of the ways by which God keeps us headed homeward. And then, says the Christian author, we can't change the process. But we can change our attitude. Says this author, here is a thought. What if we looked at the aging body as we look at the growth of a tulip plant. You see, tulip lovers rejoice the minute the tulip bulb weakens and softens. And then they say, watch that one. It's about to blossom. Likewise, could it be that the more our bodies weaken, 
the more the angels see and recognize our homecoming. The message is clear. Our bodies are weak and in this state very temporary. But answer 58, Lord's Day 22, describes the comfort in the message of life everlasting in the following way. Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life, I will have perfect blessedness such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. My brother and sister, do you believe in the risen Lord Jesus? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? If you do, then you can rejoice in the last part of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Amen. Let us.